Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of Podcast on the Brink. It's good to be back. Took last week off, and today I have a special guest, Tyler Harris, the executive director of Hoosiers for Good, which is an announcement I think a lot of you heard about the last couple of weeks in terms of what they're doing uh, with name, image, and likeness uh, at Indiana. Uh, Tyler, welcome to the show. Uh, excited to learn uh, a lot about this new organization and kind of what you guys are going to do to kind of help move, uh, help help these student athletes with the, the NIL. Yeah, Alex, appreciate you having me and um, yeah, excited to, to discuss what we're doing. So as we were talking a little bit before, this is a new uh, endeavor for you, obviously your, your background, you, you worked for IU athletics, just, you know, as, as much detail as you want to give, just kind of what, how was this thing? How did this idea become reality? And, and what, what is your role on a day-to-day basis now? You know, you've been in the job a little bit more than a month and, and you're, I'm sure you're still kind of getting your bearings, getting uh, up and running and learning uh, what you want to do every day. I'm just kind of curious for the background on, on how all this got started. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes work honestly was, was pretty solidified before I started. Um, I started on March 7th, we announced on March 8th. So there were several charitable partners that were already on board at that point. And the vision was already solidified and, and, and really Hoosiers for good is, is a nonprofit seeking 501c3 status. Um, I I'm the sole employee of Hoosiers for good. And so I report to a board of directors. Our our board is Pete Yonkman, who's the president of Cook, um, and he's the president of our board. Uh, Calvert Chaney, who's the vice president, uh, former student athlete. Um, Wes Jones, who is our treasurer. He's a former IU varsity club staff member. Um, And then Allison Jordan is our secretary, who's former women's soccer student athlete who started Everybody Plays. And we have a couple other board members um, that are that are IU alumni um, and and serve and or serve on uh, you know, at charitable organizations. And then our legal counsel is is Fred Glass, former IU athletic director. Um, and and really, Pete uh, is the brainchild behind all this. Um, I think he recognized NIL is here to stay. No one's going to change that. Um, but if we're going to do it, let's do it do it in a way that benefits everyone. Um, let, let's shine a light on charitable, uh, ch- charity, charitable organizations, and let's use student athletes NIL who are um, very recognizable in this state. You know, they're t- to a certain extent, some of them are more influential on social media than, than frankly, politicians. And so, if we can use NIL in a way that's very positive to shine a light on charitable organizations and, and all the great work that they do that seems like the Hoosier way of doing things, just doing it the right way, but using NIL, whether you love it or hate it, do it in a way that's really positive. Um, And and so I I, I think it's, it's great. And and, and we've seen several third parties, if you will, since we announced come up with this charitable component um, as well. So I I think it's great. I think it's a, it's a model that's going to take shape around the country. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, it's the Indiana way where, you know, you can use NIL in a, in a way that's going to benefit everybody. So I just want to get this out of the way first, because this is kind of, you know, my role and what I do with inside the hall, I explained to you, I've been doing this for 15 years now. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Indiana fans and, and interacting with them on a day-to-day basis via social media, via the website, via our paid community. And, I think the biggest question a lot of people have, and, and you said it, I think you made a great compelling point for why this is such a good thing is NIL is here to stay, right? You're, you're the brainchild behind this um, kind of said that, and, and I agree with you, but there's a lot of people that are just skeptical of the whole idea of NIL. And, and, I, and I think a lot of that's founded in the fact that there's this deep rooted belief with some that, that kids are given a scholarship to college and they shouldn't be compensated in other ways, but these are the rules now. And, and this is kind of how things are evolving. I guess what, you know, what would you say to those people, uh, IU fans who are maybe skeptical in terms of donating to something like this or putting their support behind something like this in terms of how this is kind of a necessary thing for the, for student athletes, uh, to have this kind of a supported IU in terms of 
ultimately Indiana being a place from an athletic department and a success standpoint that it can thrive and, and move forward. Uh, I, I think it's important for NIL to be a strength at IU. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I get it. There, there's certainly stories out there in, in ways that NIL is, is, was used in a way that really wasn't supposed to be. No one, no one thought it should be used that way. And, and so I get, I get the concern that NIL is, you know, is, is just going to, it's going to make college athletics something that it's never been about. And, 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 and fortunately, and, and for the, from a student athlete perspective, fortunately, um, it, it's here to stay. It's, it's reality. And, um, while, while some people may, may not be in favor of it, it's another factor in, in a, in a student athlete or a potential student athletes decision when, when they decided to go to a place or if they're going to remain at a place, that's another factor that they consider. And quite honestly, may be the most important factor this day and age. Can you describe just, I know this is kind of in the early stages, but you guys have already announced like the first kind of batch of deals. And there's obviously Trace Jackson Davis and Race Thompson are the, the two names from a ba- men's basketball perspective that people are going to be most familiar with. But, you know, Grace Berger was one from women's basketball, Jack Tuttle from football, several others. I'm curious if you can describe like the criteria of how these deals came about, um, not specifically on any one student athlete, but just in terms of of how you decide who you're going to partner with, how were those individuals selected? No, that's a great question. Um, You know, thankfully my previous role as the head of compliance at IU, I I knew a lot of these student athletes um, and I knew they genuinely cared about doing things um, using the NIL to positively impact whatever they're doing. Um, And I know a lot of them care about Chari- charities and shining the light on on charities. Um, so, because of my previous role, I was able to you know, know which student athletes really genuinely cared about about this endeavor, even even you know, even before we started, um, just through conversations about their interests outside of their sport. And so, you know that that helped me um, you know identify student athletes. Um, but, but then it's like anything, I, I want to make sure they're adding value. I want to make sure that they're passionate and it's like an interview process from there. Um, and so as, as we came closer to our announcement, we really honed in and, and zeroed in on those 14 student athletes, um, be, because through that process, we learned that they, that they really cared about making their community better, whether they're from the state or there's a specific charity that they really, really love and really love what they're about. And, and, and so I, I think we got a great first group. I think they're really going to positively impact um, the charitable organizations. And, and quite honestly, I was just on a, on a call with Indiana Wish um, about an hour and 15 minutes ago. And when we announced Thursday, um, our first class and, and Grace and McKenzie put out their tweets, the social media exposure for Indiana Wish in a given time frame went up 200%. And, and, and that's just awesome to see. And that's just a simple tweet. And so you can imagine as they lead into these in-person appearances, um, just how much, how, how they're going to be able to shine a light on, on some of the good work that Indiana Wish, for example, is doing. So that, that, that kind of leads me to my next question. You talked about appearances uh, specifically there for Grace and McKenzie, but in all these instances, what I, I guess, Can you just walk me through like what, not a specific deal. I'm just saying what kind of, what the obligation is from your side of things. And then what's the obligation from the student athlete side of things. Let's say there's a, you know, a men's basketball player that, that you want to partner with and and you reach a deal with, with that person. How, like what, what does the process look like from the time the deal has started to be negotiated? And then what, what, what types of things can be included in the, in the deal in terms of obligations? Can it be things like social media, in-person appearances? Uh, obviously, one thing I'm pretty sure of, you know, you can't sign a deal um, that's contingent on a, someone like coming back to school or guaranteeing like that they're going to be at school. And, and a lot of people had that question. They saw that Trace and Race came to agreements and they wondered, does that mean they're going to be back? Well, no, not necessarily because the deal doesn't necessarily stipulate that. But I'm just kind of curious from you know, a big picture perspective, how all that works and how all that ties together. I think people would be kind of curious on, on the nuts and bolts with that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, 
you know, it really depends on if, if the student athlete has a NIL agent, um, or, or not, um, if they do, you know, it typically takes longer to come to resolution than, than, than one that doesn't, but generally all agreements have similar deliverables in terms of what they have to do. And, and every student athlete will have to make a certain number of appearances with their charitable partner at one of their events. And, and when I say appearances, it could be, you know, they're, they're going there, they're signing autographs, they're, you know, doing a presentation of skills, you know, really, really runs the, runs the gamut. Um, it's not showing up for two minutes saying hi and leaving, you know, so there's, there's going to be a commitment. So there's going to be a certain number of, of appearances with their charitable partner. Um, there's going to be, you know, a certain number of, of appearances at, at our events, you know, we're, we're, we're working through some events that hopefully we'll have and, and, uh, we want them part of that in terms of social media. Um, there's going to be a required number of social media posts. Um, generally those are going to range between 12 and 14 social media posts. Um, and, 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 and the bulk of those will be promoting an upcoming appearance or at the back end, you know, them telling the story of what they learned and, and, um, what the, the charitable organization is doing, their, their mission, their, the clients they serve. And so, a certain number of appearances, a certain number of social media posts, and then every student athlete um, would be required to, in their social media bio, say that they're Hoosiers for good student athlete. And so th- those are generally kind of all the all the deliverables that are required in, in agreement. One question that I got a lot, and I don't know if you can speak to this or not, but do the deals that student athletes get vary in value based on their popularity in any way, what sport they play, or are there any other factors that would go into that? Correct. Uh, that's a good question. You know, we, we want to be diverse. We want to be broad based. Right. And, and I think our announcement shows that, but, but we're certainly not one size fits all. Um, and, and so we'll have metrics that we use to determine a range. And, and those metrics could include name recognition, uh, social media influence, the program they're associated with and their social media influence, national recognition for or national exposure for, for us, us and or charitable partner. Um, those are all metrics that, that we look at to determine a value range. And so definitely not one size fits all. When you look at the na- the landscape of NIL nationally, you know, in the release and, and you know, the different things that, that you've kind of said here and, and uh, on the website, it kind of sounds like you guys are trying to kind of set a the pathway for, for maybe what could be a model in other places. When you look out just nationally at the NIL space, I'm sure it's something that you study a lot and see what other schools are doing. Is, is it, I, I guess, where has Indiana been in terms of the space in general and is there other things that kind of go kind of go beyond? I know you don't work for IU anymore, but I'm just kind of curious, like what you've seen in terms of IU as an institution previously, how they've kind of embraced NIL. Because to me, it seemed like early on, you know, the open door s- stuff that they were they were kind of one of the first schools I think on board with that, and it seemed like they really embraced it. I'm just kind of curious: is that still the case in, in terms of where they stand and and what? Other things do you see on the horizon that that can maybe be built upon? Uh, obviously, Hoosiers for Good is going to be a big part of that. But what else is out there maybe that that in the future, in the next couple of years, that, that people can maybe look forward to? Yeah, you know, I, I think when, when we're talking about Indiana and, and the athletic department and, and kind of where they position their, themselves on NIL, I think you're right. I think they're really at the forefront. The, the reality is they're limited in what they can do. Uh, and so when we talk about, or I shouldn't say we, when I was at IU and we talked about us being at the forefront, we educated our student athletes, you know, got them in brand courses. We got them in financial literacy courses. We brought in people to educate them. At the end of the day, that's about all you can do. Um, you can educate donors, but it really takes somebody to step up to the plate and, 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 and doing these things. And so, you know, that's, that's where. Uh, I hope people understand is that when we talk about NIL on the front end of things, they are in reality, it's just, they're limited in what they can do beyond what they've done. And so, you know, I think this landscape will continue to evolve. Um, it would not surprise me one bit if in the next year, every single FBS school has a collective that's associated with it. Um, you know, and that's just the the landscape, that's the reality. And, and so what we're hopeful 
is our model is a model that other collectives that are going through the process that potentially will announce that that they take a hard look at what we're doing because it's it's a, it's a great way for to benefit everyone right you can shine a light on charitable organizations student athletes get to use their NIL there's an added benefit that student athletes from a brand perspective being involved in charitable participation um you know so so there's a there's a it's a win for for really everyone involved and so you know, I, I just think in the next couple of years, every every FBS school is going to have a collective that's associated with them. So, when you say a collective that's associated with the school, what you know, what are the I guess the rules around that? Like, how what is that actual partnership? Is there anything official, or is it just kind of like you know, obviously Hoosier for Good exists to work with IU athletes, not. Purdue or any other school. I'm just kind of curious, like what the official relationship is between Hoosiers for good and Indiana athletics. Yeah. You know, I was probably losing or using the uh, associated uh, terminology a little, little too loose. You know, it's, it's, they're completely separate, you know, and really what I meant was one that's set up to benefit student athletes at X school. Right. Um, And so there's, there's no relation with us and and IU. Um, You know, we, we, we certainly keep in touch with them from a, a transparency standpoint to make sure they're comfortable and, and, and everything. Um, but, but I'm very, because of my background, very mindful that I don't want to put them in any, any position, um, that would be of, com- to, you know, that would compromise them. What do you feel like is the biggest challenge just in terms of getting Hoosiers for good, where you want it to be in the next two, three years? Is it just educating people and kind of doing things like this, talking on this podcast, letting people know that you guys exist? What I mean, obviously you have announced this initial deal, but like, what are, I guess, your goals for maybe six months down the line in the next couple of years? What, what do you ultimately want this to be, to become? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, right now exposure, you know, people knowing that we're out there doing this, um, we're, we're, we're using NIL in a responsible way. Um, you know, the, the, I'll turn my attention next to fundraising. And, and for me, it was important to go through the first class and solidify that first class before I went to ask anybody for money. It's a lot easier to pitch a vision when you've already, sh- that you can, when you can show something as opposed to pitching a vision, then there's nothing out there. And so, you know, I think as in-person appearances and, and more social media posts go out, that'll, that'll, you know, help with, with exposure. Um, but, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're providing some really awesome opportunities and, 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 you know, we'll, we'll need donations to be able to continue these opportunities. Um, you know, the money runs out at some point. <laughs> yeah. So I noticed on the website, I clicked on the donate button. It said that in, donations at this point are not yet tax deductible. Where, where are things in terms of that process? I'm sure that's something that is of utmost importance to you. And, and obviously people want to have that when they're going to donate money to any charitable organization. I'm sure there's a lot of, I don't want to call it red tape, but anytime you're, you're getting something up and new running, you have to go uh, through the proper channels and get everything solidified. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, where things are with that and when there you could see that uh, come through and people would be able to give, get their tax benefit from donations. Yeah. You know, we've, we filed, um, four, five, one C three status. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's, you know, you go through the IRS and that process does not, is not quick. It's a nine to 12 month process. Um, and, and so we filed and, and we're, we're ready to hear more. And if we need to do anything else, um, and, and we, we think we have a persuasive argument as to why we should be. Um, but, but we're certainly not yet. Um, you know, the added benefit, you know, since, you know, we believe we've got a persuasive argument and, you know, dealing, you know, just with charities, um, the added benefit is if we do get 501c3 status, it applies retroactively. Um, so if you're, if you're giving a donation today and you know that, you know, they're not 501c3 status yet, but we are in nine months, you know, it's, it's retroactively applied. You may have to file an adjustment for your taxes, but, but it's certainly retroactive. Do, do any of these NIL collectives that are out there right now have that status to your knowledge, or is it kind of, is, are you in the same boat as other schools? I mean, this seems like it's all pretty new. I, I, I don't know if you can speak to how many other collectives are out there that are kind of charity based um, at other schools, but I'm just kind of curious if you guys 
feel like you're kind of at the forefront of, of getting that status or if, to your knowledge where other uh, associ- other collectives that may be um, associated with other schools are at in the process? Yeah, you know, I, I've certainly seen some collectives out there that say they are tax deductible and um, th- there's just no way that's true. You know, I, I just, the process takes too long and NIL is too new. Um, now, wait, while they may have a persuasive argument um, as to why they should be, I, I just... I can't believe that they would be already tax deductible, knowing that our legal counsel said it's going to take nine to twelve months. Um, so, so I haven't I haven't seen outside of that um, a lot, um, you know, even say that they're tax deductible. I've seen a few um, ever since our announcement on March eighth. I think uh, a, a third party affiliated with Kentucky announced that they're going to engage in you know charitable activity through a through a collective. Ohio mm-hmm. State, I believe, well, I shouldn't say Ohio State, a third party to Ohio right. State um, yeah. announced uh, a charitable, It's I think it's called the foundation. Um, so they're they're going to be involved in charitable activities. And then last uh, last Friday, Clemson, uh, I always screw that up, a group <laughs> yeah, associated with yeah, Clemson. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, it's, it's hard to it's hard to talk about, you know, it's like, I get it. it. It's, 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 it's all new. And so the way we right. phrase it, but, but we understand what you're right. saying. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. No, no. And, and, and so I think last Friday, a group associated with Clemson using that associated word loosely again, um, have, have announced a collective that's a, that, that, that has a charitable focus. And I think there's already $6 million in, in that one. So um, they're starting to pop up. And, and so I think, no, I think that's good. You know, if, if people want to, you know, take up, take off our model and I'm not saying they are, you know, but I, I I'm going to, I'm going to take credit. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, no, that's, that's good. That's, that's, I, I think that's a positive way to use NIL. If somebody does make a donation, I think another question a lot of people have is anytime they donate money, they want to know, you know, a lot of charities are graded in a way like for, for every dollar I donate, like wh- where's that dollar going? Um, I think that's like a transparency thing that a lot of people like as much as you can share, if somebody makes a donation to Hoosiers for good, how is that money being used at this time? I, I don't, I'm not asking you for like a detailed sheet of percentages. I'm just kind of curious for g- generally speaking, how is that, how is that uh, allocated? Yeah. You know, one of, one of our, you know, kind of main priorities is to be transparent. And, and so you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, following up with donors, you know, we really want them to, to, to know where their donations go. And so I, so I imagine us writing handwritten notes or emails to them and letting them know how we're using that money um, mm-hmm. and, and, and which charity that their money is going to you know, be benefiting through a student athletes NIL um, because we want to be transparent. We don't want anybody to donate money and have zero idea where it's going. And so there, there'll be a follow-up uh, from us, um, whether it's a thank you card or just an email letting them know here's a portion of your money and how, how it's, how it's being utilized. I want to ask you, you know, obviously you're in a different role now, but you have spent some time obviously in the compliance area at IU athletics. And I don't want to make this specific to IU, but what, what are the biggest challenges that these universities, these power five schools are facing right now when it comes to NIL, because it doesn't seem like, there's a lot of guidance or direction from the NCAA. Obviously the NCAA kind of kicked this can down the road as long as they could until they had no other choice, but to do this or they were going to be subject to, I think a lot of lawsuits and, and really the model just of how things worked for so long was no longer going to stand up in the environment, but I'm in the current environment, which I think it's good that this change came about as, as difficult it was to get to this point. I think, Ultimately, it should benefit everybody uh, moving forward. But I'm just kind of curious from a compliance perspective. You know, you know, you're you have the unique perspective that you've kind of been on both sides of it. What what are the challenges that compliance departments, not just at IU but in general, are having with NIL, and and what kind of things do you think need to improve moving forward to to be able to navigate these waters to where everyone's everyone's one thing I'll add to people everyone's never going to be on the same playing field, no matter what system we have, let's acknowledge that. But I think there needs to be at least some kind of uniform rules that everyone's playing by. And it doesn't seem like that's the case right now. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a couple of factors in there. 
uh, that, that, that make it difficult. Um, you know, it starts out with, if you're in a state with a state law or you're not, and Indiana is not. So our applicable regulatory authority is the NCA. And so we've always, and I'm talking when I was, was at, was at IU, we had always been able to go to the NCA and ask questions. Hey, we've got this specific scenario. Can you, can you help us interpret it, uh, give us interpretation on that scenario so we can provide guidance? With NIL and the current legal environment, being so concerned about an overly restricted answer, the NCA has not really been answering questions related to NIL. And, and I get it from their perspective. It's probably hard from their perspective. Um, I used to work at the NCA. You know, a lot of people bash it. There's a lot of great people that do a lot of great work there. Um, this current legal environment makes it really challenging. Um, and so I think that's the biggest concern from a compliance perspective is for so long, we've been trained to ask questions and now we're not getting answers. And that's what makes it hard. So when you don't have that guidance from a compliance perspective, what kind of, do you just kind of rely on other people and you kind of just have to make a decision? I mean, I know, and I'll say this um, because, you know, I've known different people throughout the years that have worked in compliance and I kind of know how IU has always been. I mean, they, they fired Kelvin Sampson for text messages and phone calls. IU compliance has been the thing at IU for a long time. And it's been important to the athletic directors, you know, the, since I've covered the team, I know Fred Glass and Scott Dolson have been, you know, they're very, very focused on compliance being at the forefront of how they want to run their department. But when you're not getting answers, it seems like to me that could leave a lot of gray area in terms of different, different rules being interpreted in different ways. Am I, correct in assuming that? Yeah, you know, I, th- I think that's that's definitely a fair assessment. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, you have to you have to look at yourself in the eyes and, and your department and really fall back on your core values and and who you are, what you want to be. And, and and I think we've done a pretty good job. I use done a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, well, with, hey, with you've that. only you've only been out of the month job for a month, so you can you <laughs> yeah, you still you're still in your grace period. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, but, but, you know, we, we still have the added benefit of talking to our peers um, at other schools who may have encountered a situation similarly and how they handled it. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely challenging. And at the end of the day, you have to fall back on your values and who you are and who you want to be and, and let that guide you to make a, a reasonable decision and, and, and give a reasonable you know, response. One thing I'm curious, this first class of the 14 athletes, the charities that you, that they're aligned with, how, how did those, you know, I don't know if you can speak specifically to Trace and Race and how they were kind of aligned with the one they were, or Grace Berger, McKenzie Holmes, any of them specific. I'm just kind of curious how those specific, um, obviously you have to assign somebody to each, to each one and f- kind of find some synergy there. I'm just kind of curious what that process looked like and, and if you can speak maybe to, to Trace and Race, how their specific uh, partnership came together. Yeah, yeah, I'll speak. Um, you know, at a, at a general level, um, you know, knowing student athlete schedules um, or student athlete schedules are very challenging, right? You know, you got they've got class and then they've got practice, and and managing those schedules and and knowing when they're available for an appearance, for example, is super challenging because um, they don't know what they're doing two weeks from now. Um, and so, I thought it was important to pair student athletes that were from the same sport together as much as possible. Um, because mm-hmm. when trace trace is not practicing, I also know race is not practicing, um, you know, required practice anyways. And so that, that made it a little bit easier in doing it that way. You know, and the other thing that I, that I thought was important in, in this process is, you know, I, and, I'll, and I'll flip a question to you that will help me give a good, a good answer. Four weeks ago before our announcement, had you ever heard of turnstone? Um, you know, that, that charity or, or even stop the violence in Indianapolis. No, I hadn't, to be honest, I looked at the list. I hadn't heard of, of, of any of those. Yeah. So, so turnstone and, and stop the violence in Indianapolis who trace and race are, are partnered with, you know, they, they, they do a lot of good work, but they don't have a lot of resources to help amplify and continue their mission. And I thought it was important for student athletes who did have a huge platform to be able to expose all the great work that, that those two charitable organizations um, 
do, you know, and, and their mission and their clients they serve. And so that was part of the decision too. Um, and, and, you know, the other, the other charitable organizations, you know, Riley children's, you know, Indiana wish, you know, people, people have heard of those. Um, and, and I'm not saying that in a way that I wouldn't have partnered trace or race with them. Um, and it was, it was just kind of a, it was a puzzle and, and, you know, part of, part of the decision was, well, I need a pair of student athletes from the same sports together. Cause that makes it easier. And then, um, you know, some charities that, that we haven't heard of, maybe it's good for this first round to have those student athletes have a, high, a big platform uh, to really shine a light on, on, on those organizations. And then Trace being from Indianapolis um, area and, and stop the violence, you know, with the gun violence rising in Indianapolis, that was important. And then Race, um, you know, when he was super vocal um, and being from Minneapolis with, uh, with George Floyd, you know, those that, that just made a lot of sense. I noticed on the website, there's also something that's listed as an incubator type program before going forward. It sounds like student athletes are going to be able to pitch potential deal. How, what, obviously this is kind of still in the infancy stages of how everything's going to work, but what can you tell us about that and what opportunities there may be for student athletes that weren't in this first initial class to maybe get involved in this moving forward? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so, so really our classes, you know, our spring class, and, and we're hopeful to have a fall class. You know, really the, those, those announcements are, are geared towards student athletes who already have a voice, a platform to, to add value. Um, but, but we certainly don't want to exclude other student athletes. And so this charitable incubator program um, is really designed for student athletes who, who may not have a voice yet, who may not have a platform, but are super passionate about a, a specific charitable cause. And so they would submit a proposal to us um, explaining the, the charitable organization that they're passionate about, why they're passionate about it, activities they've done in the past, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and we could enter into an agreement with them um, through this charitable incubator program um, to help them uh, you know, develop their voice and, and philanthropic entrepreneurialism. So what, just one other thing to clarify on the first 14, was that a – instance where you reached out to these 14 specifically you you did this the board how, kind of how what was the process of actually selecting the first 14 and how that worked or was it them reaching out to you and saying they're interested or obviously as being a uh, kind of a new thing I, I assume that you did most of the reaching out to them uh, at the initial stages yeah yeah you know I, I reached out to them um, you know, there was certainly a few more, um, but, but as I mentioned earlier, it's almost like an interview process, right? And, and I want to make sure that they're passionate about what we're doing and, and really genuinely care um, because that's how you add value. And so, um, so yeah, we, we've got it down to 14 and I, and I reached out to them you know, individually to talk to them um, over the phone at a high level and then would meet with them in person uh, to talk more specifics about what we were doing. Um, and since our announcement, um, you know, we, I've had several student athletes and charitable organizations reach out saying they want to be involved. And, and so that's been great. Yeah. I was just curious, kind of, before we get you out of here, just what kind of, what's the, obviously you had this initial group of charitable organizations that you worked at. I mean, obviously you've had a nice run here last couple of weeks of positive publicity, getting the word out. What's kind of been the response in terms of, um, hearing from other charitable organizations and I guess how optimistic are you moving forward that you're going to have to go out and obviously raise money. Now you mentioned that earlier. What's what, what, what are these next couple of months going to look like for you and, and how just kind of, how do you feel like you're set up to be successful here over those next couple of months? Yeah. You know, um, ever since our announcement last Thursday, you know, where we have eight charitable partners at that point, I've had probably three or four reach out since. Um, so in the, in the six days since we announced, um, several more have, have asked to be a part of this program. And, um, and so that, that's exciting, you know, because we, we want as many charitable organizations involved as possible. Um, I, I don't envision us excluding anyone in the state of Indiana if they want to be involved. Um, and then in, t- in, terms of, in terms of fundraising, you know, uh, you know we'll, we'll be doing that for the next couple months. And, and hopefully there'll be a lot of support, um, like, like I said, you know, NIL is here to stay. Um, it's a factor in everybody's decision now, nowadays. And, and it's important uh, for us to be able to show that there are big opportunities here. But while you're doing those big opportunities, we're going to do it the Indiana way and make you better people while we're doing it. 
What's the best way for folks to connect with Hoosiers for Good moving forward and to learn more? Obviously, uh, we'll have the uh, the website, everything linked in the show notes. But uh, you know, what's in your mind? You know, if there's one or two ways for people, you obviously you're on Twitter and just kind of getting that presence growing and, and everything. But you have a website. Just well, speak speak however you want on this. Just in, in terms of people connecting with Hoosiers for Good, what's the most efficient way to do that? And if if there are some, if there is somebody listening that's involved with a charitable organization, what's the best way to reach out and get involved? Yeah, you know, certainly give us a follow on social media. Um, that that'll keep you updated on all the the great things we're doing. Um, you can see that this is not a, you know, it's not it's not one of the the things where, you know, we're just entering into agreements just to be able to you know, get athletes or pay athletes. That's not what this is about. Um, our student athletes are going to work and they're going to really add value. Um, and, and so we're, we're going to be posting, posting those, uh, you know, appearances, et cetera. Um, but, but also don't hesitate to email me, uh, tyler.harris at hoosiersforgood.org. Happy to talk, talk to anybody about what we're doing. Um, you know, I think it's a very important endeavor um, that goes for, for charities or for any potentially interested donors to anybody who just wants to learn more. Um, and so I, I, I would encourage anybody to reach out and I'm happy to talk to them. Um, but the more people we get to understand that NIL is the reality, um, but let's do it the Indiana way. I think the, the better off we're all going to be. Excellent stuff, Tyler. And just, you don't have to respond to this, but this, this is just me editorializing for a second. I think the fact that you have the experience that you do, with the athletic department working in compliance, you know, it, it sounds to me like this is going to be, uh, you know, you know, obviously there's a lot of challenges ahead and everything that you, you're going to have to do. But I think the way that this is, is working out in terms of your background and everything, I, I think it's going to be an excellent fit. And hopefully, you know, I, you know, I, I try to tell people, um, as I said earlier in the show, there's a lot of people who are skeptical about this and have questions about it. I appreciate the fact that you've come on and been as transparent as possible and also the fact, you know, we can't say it enough is NIL is here to stay. And, it, you know, a lot of people who are listening to the show are asking me, you know, when's the next five-star recruit going to re- commit to Indiana or when's Indiana going to go to a final four? Well, NIL is now a big part of that. And I think anything that um, obviously you're not directly affiliated with IU, but you exist to work with student athletes in Indiana. I think anything that Indiana can do uh, that's within the rules that, that is obviously uh, something that, that can benefit student athletes and also the athletic department is an excellent thing. So thanks again, Tyler, for the time. I won't make you uh, respond to that, but uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we certainly appreciate it. And and thank you for, for coming on and answering all of our questions as for, podcast on the brink we will be back next week with another episode it's been a busy off season so far still a lot to determine in terms of the roster for next season uh, recruiting beginning to heat up and all that so if you if you enjoy the show leave us a rating or a review on apple podcasts or spotify and we'll be back next week with another episode of podcast on the brink